Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News Weekend. I'm Dennis Ward. The Saskatoon Police Service has confirmed that human remains found on the banks of the Saskatchewan River near the village of St. Louis, Saskatchewan on September 29th are those of Megan Gallagher. Gallagher was a 30-year-old Métis woman from Saskatoon. She went missing in September 2020. In December 2021, police called her death a homicide. Nine people are charged in connection with her death. Three are in custody, charged with first-degree murder. And police are still looking for Summer Sky Henry, who is also charged with murder. Six others face various charges in connection with Gallagher's death. All charges were laid before her remains were found. After a provincial investigation and after their loved one died while in care at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital, a Mi'kmaq family continues to demand answers. Angel Moore brings us up to date. Beep, 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 and I even said, help, help, you know. That's Judy Sark of the Escazoni First Nation, describing the night she called for help from her hospital bed at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. Her friend and fellow patient, Bridget Ann Denny, had fallen on the floor and could not get up. Sark still remembers that night. I keep on pressing that beep, beep, beep sound. And then when I pressed it, nobody came and helped her. And I keep on saying, help! Somebody fell down. You know, I, I had to because she was my friend. Denny, 65 years old, was a residential school survivor, spoke the Mi'kmaq language, was a mother of five and 15 grandchildren, and an active community member of the Eskazoni First Nation, unexpectedly died on January 20, 2021. She was admitted the night before for complications due to diabetes, but died the next morning. Her family found out after the funeral, Denny had fallen in the middle of the night. An investigation was called under the Protection for Persons and Care Act. The final report concluded the facility failed to provide adequate care. Jenny Lee Francis, Denny's daughter, says... It was just... It was very hard to read the report. It was very hard to read the report. <laughs> According to the report, the fall was consistently reported as unwitnessed Therefore, investigators were unable to determine how the fall occurred and the length of time the affected patient was on the floor. The report continues that around 2 a.m., another patient was ringing their call bell while standing in the doorway attempting to get attention of the staff, saying someone is on the floor in here and someone needs help in here. This patient did not want to appear on camera, but told APTN News the report left out some details. Although unable to walk due to a minor stroke, this patient crawled across the floor to call for help. A detail Sark told the investigators. But uh, he said, Judy, is she all right? I said, uh, I think so. She's holding on to my bed. And uh, he said, uh, nobody's coming. And she cr he crawled and he just got a stroke. Sark says she felt the investigators were trying to lead her, saying she could not have possibly seen the aftermath of the fall because it was too dark. According to Sark, Denny complained to staff she hurt her head. Finally, the guy came. He said, what you doing down there? He said, I've, I've fallen. Hit my head. We put her allegations to the Nova Scotia Department of Seniors and Long-Term Care. They conducted the investigation and found inadequate care in Denny's case. In an email statement to APTN News, they said, Under privacy conditions, the department cannot comment on specific individuals or complaints. Mary I. Joe Francis, Denny's daughter-in-law, is frustrated. That's the point of everything, not only for the hospital to be held accountable, because somebody has to be held accountable for this, but the awareness that this is happening and it shouldn't be happening and that people need to speak up. The family filed a complaint with the College of Physicians and Surgeons, which has determined a review will be conducted by an investigation committee of the college. The family has contacted the medical examiner to conduct a private investigation.
There's too many stories like ours. There's too many. And there's a lot of people that never got the help they needed or any sources or proof of anything. And since we got this far, we have to keep going. Joe Francis hopes to find a lawyer to help with the process. Nobody tells you how to deal with this sort of situation. Um, with all of the complaints, with all of the investigation, all of the reports, nobody tells you or guides you that you can do this stuff. In the meantime, the family is filing a complaint with the Nova Scotia College of Nursing. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Eskazoni, First Nation. Use of the Innu language is in decline in the North Shore region of Quebec, but that hasn't stopped one non-Indigenous man from picking up the language. To the surprise and delight of many in the Innu community he works in. Here's that story, the original by Shushan Bakong, voiced by Tom Fenario. He Bella Salve isn't indigenous, but everyone in the Inu community of Maniotanam knows who he is. After all, it's hard to miss the Quebecois outreach worker who can carry a conversation in the Inu language. La Salve says his spoken Inu frequently shocks people, in a good way. <laughs> the Sal has a trick. He sticks labels on the walls to remember his Inu vocabulary, and they also serve as reminders. Thanks to his trusty label maker, the labels are everywhere in his house. Another thing that helps Lassard, he's gregarious. Lassard <laughs> <laughs> has been a speaker for two years. <laughs> It sometimes leads to odd situations where he's speaking Inu to Inu people, who in turn are speaking French to him. Originally from the Quebec City area, Lassard first arrived in the community eight years ago to attend the renowned Inu Nikamu Music Festival, where he fell in love with Inu music. Wanting to understand the lyrics led to him learning the language known as Inu Amun. <laughs> One step at a time is good advice, but in the case of LaSalle, one label at a time might be more appropriate. A story by Shoshan Bacon, APTN National News, Maniotanam, Quebec. Such a cool story. Tuesday was Indigenous Veterans Day. We'll take you to some of the ceremonies after the break. Welcome back. Indigenous veterans have served in Canada's armed forces for decades, but you wouldn't know it by looking at their military headstones. It was only this year that Beechwood National Military Cemetery in Ottawa unveiled Indigenous spiritual symbols for grave markers. Here's Lindsay Richardson with a profile of the Cree vet who had the honor of being the first. Is that Daddy? There's nothing quite like a father-daughter reunion. 
<laughs> and thanks to military life, Leah and Justin Cannell had a few. I just remember that daddy um, made me laugh a lot yeah. and had pillow fights and like tickle fights. A I lot. loved pillow fights. Today, the reunion looks a little bit different. Corporal Justin Cannell died unexpectedly in November 2021 and is buried here at Beechwood National Military Cemetery in Ottawa. He was an amazing father and husband. Yeah, we just we miss him desperately. I wish we had more time with him. To mark one year since his passing, Justin's daughter Leah, his widow Caitlin, and close friend Andrew have come to the site to lay medicine, a braid of sweet grass, a box of hand-picked sage, and berries as sustenance for the spirit world. Justin was in the process of really kind of reclaiming his culture. Yeah, he was trying to learn Cree. He had learned a little bit of Cree. Yeah, he had smudged. He didn't know where to start. Mm -hmm. There was a, a lot of intergenerational trauma. And I, I mean, we all know the stories. Justin was born in Indian Head, Saskatchewan, and enlisted in the military in 2007, serving overseas in Latvia, Ukraine, and Iraq. Here at Beechwood, military families are offered the option to customize headstones with spiritual symbols. But at the time of Justin's death, none existed for Indigenous veterans. What I didn't know at the time is they had already been in the process of getting more symbols approved to kind of represent the breadth of Canadians that, that serve. Several months later, in June 2022, Justin's headstone, Beechwood's first ever featuring an engraving of the medicine wheel, was officially erected. It's now one of 11 symbols available for family members seeking to bury their loved ones here. You've got the Christian symbols, you've got the Star of David, you've got um, symbols for uh, the Muslim community, you've got symbols for the agnostic community, uh, paganism, so Wicca. Indigenous folk have been part of the military since um, since the 1500s and now we're finally recognizing them uh, properly and allowing their cultures to be seen. At the same time Justin's stone was unveiled, Beechwood also inaugurated its first ever Métis headstone and McCarthy says even now the cemetery is working with the military and community stakeholders on a third spiritual symbol to honor Inuit veterans. I think it's representation and I think a lot of people don't realize that the road to reconciliation comes with that recognition and that representation. Those who knew Justin best know it would be a source of pride. He would have loved it. He would have freaked would have out. Bragged. He would have bragged. Yeah, yeah he bragged would have boasted about it. 100%. He would have been so proud. He would have yeah. been. And yeah. he probably would have been like shocked or something like I that. I think a bit too. Yeah, I think so. He wasn't a cocky guy, but the things that uh, he could show off about, he, he would uh, be cocky about them. People coming to your life as either a lesson or a blessing. And Justin was both. Yeah, he was a blessing to have in, in our he life. Was. And there's there's been so much to learn from his life since he's passed. So we've been a little lost, not going to lie. Um, we're finding our way, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For now, they have at least one cardinal point right here. A reminder of Cannell's military contribution and culture tucked between Beechwood's crosses, row on row. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Ottawa. In Halifax, the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Centre hosted an Indigenous veteran service. The Minister of Indigenous Services Canada came to show support. Angel Moore has that story. Indigenous flag bearers began Tuesday service for Indigenous veterans who have served and sacrificed. About 100 people gathered at the lower level of the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Centre. Elder Debbie Eisen is a veteran with a 36-year military career. She says Indigenous veterans are honoured at every gathering, which is held on November 8th because... Back in history when Indigenous veterans were not allowed to lay wreaths at the November the 11th ceremony, so we have our own ceremony in our communities to honour our Indigenous veterans. The service included Mi'kmaq songs and John McRae's famous poem in Flanders Fields, read in Mi'kmaq. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu attended the event. We all have a duty to understand how colonization and the 
colonial practices of Canada have discriminated against Indigenous people and, and, and hurt them, even people who have served this country so proudly and with such ferocity up to and including losing their lives. About 7,000 First Nations people served in the Korean and First and Second World Wars. Angel Moore, Jabuktuk, known as Halifax. The Métis Nation Saskatchewan held an intimate ceremony at Batoche to honour their veterans. This is the second year that MS held this ceremony at Batoche. Métis men and women have a long history of military service to protect and defend Canada. The monument at Batoche recognizes their sacrifices and displays Métis veterans' names as a way to honour and thank them. Despite serving his country throughout the entirety of the Second World War, First Nations veteran Elijah Smith was not treated as an equal when he returned home. But as Sarah Connors explained, Smith's experience in the war laid the foundation for him to become one of the territory's most celebrated First Nations leaders. This hang for a lot of years in the Council for Yukon First Nations. Mm -hmm. Steve and Smith um, beams Brad with Chief pride when it comes to talking about his father, Should Elijah Smith. Elijah is best known for his groundbreaking work in leading land claim and self-government agreements for First Nations in Yukon. Among his many accomplishments, he also served six years in World War II. He was really, really proud of, of having the uniform and, and serving the country and going off. Elijah was born in 1912 in Champaign, Yukon. In 1939, he enfranchised himself so he could enlist in the war. He saw it as an opportunity to see the world, and he saw it as an opportunity to, to do his part. Um, and I think most veterans did that. Elijah was trained in heavy equipment operation and was part of the Dieppe raid in northern France. Smith says his father was reluctant to share what he witnessed. I think this is typical of... A Canadian soldier or somebody who's who fought in the Second World War. However, he did talk about his positive experiences fighting alongside non-Indigenous soldiers. Fighting, you know, side by side uh, with other individuals who are not of the same race, um, you know, uh, fashioned his outlook when he came home, right? But when Elijah returned home, he was disenfranchised and dismayed to learn he didn't qualify for the same benefits as other soldiers, like receiving land for farming. That was kind of like the first initial um, reasons why he was like, okay, well, this is, this is interesting that I, I'm not really a citizen within my, within my own homeland, right? Elijah was later elected as chief of the Champagne and Ajac First Nations in the late 1960s and went on to lead several Yukon First Nations organizations. In 1973, he spearheaded a delegation of Yukon First Nations leaders to Ottawa to present Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. The meeting marked the beginning of modern land claims negotiations in the territory. His leadership style came, I believe, came directly from his experience in the war. He, he always says that. I, I, it gave me a trade, right? And he came back and he ran a little trucking company. A, couple of a trucks. former chief himself, Smith says his father is an inspiration. You know, you try to make this world a better place and, and you have a, I directly have a responsibility to his sacrifice to ensure that I live, you know, I try to live up to his ideals. Elijah remained a well-known leader in the Yukon until his death in 1991. Smith says it's important to remember soldiers like his father who put their life on the line. I'm proud of the fact that he, he fought in the Second World War. Um, he, you know, he, he served his country. Um, and, and he served uh, all of us today. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Still to come, the overlooked role of the Iroquois during the War of 1812. Stay with us.
Welcome back. The contributions and sacrifice of Iroquois allied to the British during the War of 1812 is often overlooked. They played a major role in the battle between British and American forces. Last weekend, there was a solemn ceremony in Niagara Falls to honour these so-called forgotten soldiers. Steve Monjo reports. The sound of rifle shots and battle cries have long since disappeared. But over 200 years ago, Queenston Heights Park was the site of one of the most famous battles in Canadian history. And it's where veterans and the public came to honour and remember the Six Nations members who fought here. We're kind of coming uh, out of the shadow of, uh, of uh, Canadian history as well as uh, American history. So our stories and contributions to wars uh, is starting to be more highlighted now in the, con in the positive contributions that we did uh, throughout these specific battles. The, the Battle of Queenston Heights, if it wasn't for the warriors to come up the heights to pin down the Americans, um, the British would never have had the opportunity to turn back, to gather together and, and push up the heights and push the Americans off. So it's little stories like that, and that's only a small one example of many that uh, we get to highlight on a day like today as well as you know recognize our indigenous veterans. Most Canadians think the War of 1812 was fought between the British and Americans but 10,000 Iroquois and other indigenous allies fought on the British side. Niagara Park senior advisor Tim Johnson says without their help this park and the surrounding area could have been part of New York State. Most historians today say that were it not for the contributions of First Nations, uh, Canada would look very different if it were not in fact absorbed into the United States. That's a huge history lesson for the entire country. And so we build from that and then bring out all of the detail of all of the service that Indigenous peoples have had, going back to when they were allies nation to nation, to today working uh, and serving in the Canadian uh, Armed Forces. Howard Hill was one of the veterans honored at the Valor and Victory Service. He feels it's important to support their service and remember their sacrifice for future generations. Oh yes it is, you know, you gotta carry the tradition on, you know, like uh, I'm a third generation veteran. I, my grandfather was in World War I, my father was in World War II. My brother and my brother-in-law and I were in the Vietnam War, so it's a tradition that we try to carry on. Unfortunately, I don't have any kids in anything. I hope we don't have to have any in, in the wars, but uh, if we do, uh, we'll support them in any way we can. Steve Monjo, APTN National News, Niagara Falls, Ontario. And that is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this weekend. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.